Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to be working on two items. First, somewhere around here, we're going to put some Atmos suits in. And then, we're going to be building a power plant. And I'm thinking around here. In fact, we can make it big enough to hold all of our industry as well. Good news on the food front is we are still maintaining a very high amount of calories. So I think it's about time to grab dupe number 10. Looking at these three dupes, I wouldn't mind any of the three. Bert is a plus 11 strength tidier with critter version and plant murderer. Okay, so we'd be a general pick everything up dupe. We have Bonnie who would be a pretty good rancher. Starts off with plus seven. Yeah, the trait is aesthetic design, which is a who cares. But then we have irritable bowel, undigging, and pacifism, which really doesn't matter when you're a rancher. And then we have Ashcan, which could be also be a rancher and also do some farming. The only thing they can't do is build. So either way, I think it's a win for us. We head on over to PowerShell, hit the up button. Looks like we're taking Ashcan. As for the name, well, Ashcan's good at a quite a few things, but not really excellent at any. So we're gonna throw some shade at Hawkeye. Welcome to paradise, Hawkeye. Now in the background, we've been working on these hatch farms and we're up to a fairly decent amount of hatches. And it's for that reason that we got rid of all the meal lice and we're just going with hatches and bristle blossoms. Now, I think we'll run bristle blossoms for quite some time because eventually we're gonna wanna use the microbe musher to create some berry sludge. But once all these ranches are fully populated, it's enough for 15 duplicates. And I also think we have enough water for our oxygen center to create oxygen for 15 duplicates. So I think right now, our number is probably 16 with opportunity to grow from there. Some other stuff I've done in the background is I sealed up this cool steam vent and surrounded it with metal tiles. Now this may not work long term, but right now Rhyme is still pretty cold. You can see around it the average temperature is 10-15 degrees, and it should get colder. Now the reason why it's even that high is because all that cool steam vent water was sitting here. Now Rhyme is going to do what Rhyme does, continuously chill, and so I wanted to try just surrounding the cool steam vent with metal tiles. That way it injects chill onto these temperature shift plates. So when the cool steam vent does erupt, the steam instantly turns into water. We then pump all that water out. In fact, that warm water will actually help us out in our main water tank anyways. If we're dropping hot water into here, it should keep this water warm enough to where this liquid tepidizer doesn't even need to run as long. And what are we using all that water for? Well, research and bristle blossoms. So last week I had made a comment about removing the water cooler and putting in the party line phone. That way we don't have to give the dupes food poisoned water. And everybody was quick to jump on me saying, hey, you can disable the water cooler. Yes, I know you can disable the water cooler, but that's not fair. The dupes would end up just staring at the water cooler, sitting there so thirsty, just wanting a little cup of water. And there's a sign on it that says out of order. That's just mean. And that's not how we treat our dupes around here. Of course, now they don't even have a water cooler to stare at, so which one's better? I don't know. We've also temporarily closed in this natural gas geyser. We are going to be tapping into it when we start building our beautiful power plant, because the first power we're going to get into is going to be natural gas. So one simple thing I wanted to do before we got into Atmos suits was adjusting our incubators. I don't mind having one incubator always powered, but we might actually be able to do this better. Remember, an unpowered incubator will give you five eggs in 100 cycles and we need 50. So our nine incubators here will actually give us 45 eggs in 100 cycles, which will make us just a few shy. So what I think we're gonna do to not waste power is actually put in some critter sensors on each one of these hatch ranches. And we're gonna tie all of these in, and that way any time a ranch is not up to eight hatches, it'll power this on. Now we want it to wait a minute because one of these incubators could have a hatch ready, in which case the duplicate will just come grab it and there's no reason powering it on then. We only want to power that incubator when there's sort of a, a death wave, when we have a bunch of hatches die all of at once, and that's how we'll set it up. Let me show you the automation here in a minute. All right, here's the automation that we have set up. This is a filter gate. A filter gate says, if I've received a green signal for X amount of time, then output a green signal. Otherwise, output a red signal. In this case, we have it set on the max 200 seconds. So being that a cycle is 600 seconds, if any of those critter sensors detect that there's less than eight critters in any of the stables, for more than 200 seconds, it'll fire a green signal across. And then it heads down to this OR gate. The OR gate says, if I get a green signal from either this filter gate or from this signal switch, go ahead and turn on. 
The reason why we do this is just in case we want to power this incubator even though there is at least eight critters in each of these stables. You can see that each critter sensor is set on eight and below. So anytime there's below eight is when it'll send a green signal. Because every once in a while, one of these hatches is going to die. And we don't necessarily want to power an incubator immediately because there may be hatches ready in any of these incubators. And if there are, a duplicate's gonna come and grab it and put it back in the stable, bringing the critter count up to eight. There's no reason to power the incubator unless, well, there hasn't been any critters ready for a little while and it's been a third of a cycle, we're still waiting. And if that's the case, we'll go ahead and power the incubator up. Because remember, the unpowered incubators take 20 cycles to hatch and the powered incubator only takes four. Now it's time to do Atmo suits. And the reason why we're getting to Atmos suits now, because we're going to need some oil. There are no Drecos on this planetoid that I have found. So we don't have an opportunity to raise glossy Drecos to get oil. Why do we need oil? Because we need plastic. And we want plastic, that way we can eventually start building steam turbines. And unfortunately, that's also locked behind applied science research, which is just the new name for materials science, and it's actually still created at the materials study terminal. We're not quite ready for that yet. But the first step is gonna be figuring out where we want the Atmos suits to come in. I think I've decided that we're actually gonna put the Great Hall on this level. That way it's right next to the kitchen. Now, soon we're gonna be expanding this kitchen and making some infinite food storage, etc., etc. But in the long haul, we want this to be our Great Hall. And I also, I wanna move the barracks down to here because it's closer to both the bathroom setup and the Great Hall. So that leaves this section here, and I think it's as good as any for Atmo suits. But first, let's rebuild that Great Hall. I think that looks pretty good. This gives us 26 mess tables, which is, you know, a little to grow on. We may not eventually get up to 26, but hey, at least it's nice and symmetrical. We got the party flying phone in the middle, and then we have a bunch of hanging pots for some decor. That just about finishes this. Even though we still have two tables left to construct and a little bit of sweeping, these dupes are taking forever to do everything. We just need more dupes. But now we can finally get rid of this one and then they'll all just end up transferring over to this great hall. Now let's do the same with the cots. And because we need dupes, we're actually gonna accept one of these. I am not excited really about any of them. Ellie and Ren look decent, even though their skills are a little hodgepodgey. I do like Ren. I think he could be a future mechatronics engineer. Nicola, digging and rocketry aren't really two skills that we typically put side by side in a dupe, but hey, we'll take what we can get at this point. Back over to PowerShell, we hit up to remember the command. We have dupe number one. Ellie comes to us with some skills in tidying, rocketry, and operating. Because she can hold her breath for a long time, and she seemingly likes to fly with rocketry, let's go with Supergirl on this one. The question is, what do we put her into? I think she's going to be our mechatronics engineer. She's the first dupe that we've had that has actually had some morale bonuses and operating, so that's where her path is heading. So I figured out why these mess tables weren't being completed. We originally had them being built out of gold amalgam. And they're probably just having problems getting it because they don't have any Atmos suits. But we don't want to build our mess tables out of gold amalgam anyways. But we are running a little low on copper ore as well. So something for us to keep in mind. Fear not, we can always find more. We're going to dig all this out anyways with the construction of our power plant. So might as well just get started now. All right, with all of that moved, we now can put on our Atmos suits. We start with the docks. And then I figure we'll just start with, say, 16 suits. With 16 docks, now we just need to tie it into our oxygen setup. And remember, we're going to use this center one here. I sat there and stared at this for a minute, and I figured the best way is going to be able to do this is just use the top gas line to load these up. We're going to send this middle line in to oxygenate the right side of the base. And we're just going to disconnect this here. And then we're just going to use a gas brace to tie in the rest. I couldn't get around it. I think it just looks better this way. And then we tie in our, all of our vents. Make sure they are all powered. And once they're done, we'll be able to put the checkpoint there and seal this base up and be ready to go. But first, we actually need some exosuits. Old Clark Kent almost finished building the exosuit forge, and then we'll order 16 to be constructed. Clark Kent is really, really not good at building. Oh yeah, construction skill of zero. Ten minutes later. Seriously, Clark, just finish it.
Yeah, I'm pretty sure Clark's actually gonna stop and go eat before this thing's finished. And there he goes. Because, of course he did. Thank you, Dr. Banner. We already have 23 reed fiber from our beautiful bathroom reed fiber setup. This thing is just working like a charm. These radiant liquid pipes are keeping this area nice and warm, just the way the thimble reed likes it. And as a result, we have 23 reed fibers. We also collected a bunch from around here. So in total, we have 51 reed fiber, which is plenty to get started on some ACMO suits. Remember, each suit's gonna cost you two reed fiber up front, and then you're eventually gonna have to repair some worn suits, which takes one more reed fiber. Hopefully our reed fiber setup will be enough to repair the suits as they get worn. Because remember, playing on max difficulty also means that the suits wear out a lot quicker. We'll start with 16 Atmos suits, and that'll be plenty for the docks that we put in. Since the dupes are taking just about ever to do everything, I wanted to stop and correct something I said in my last video. Brian Lacey correctly points out that Gold Amalgam actually has the lowest thermal conductivity of all the ores, despite it having a very high thermal conductivity out of the refined metals. The reason why we use Gold Amalgam, though, is because of that overheat temperature. But I did say thermal conductivity, so I wanted to make sure I came back on that. One of the reasons why we used the Gold Amalgam early on is because it has the higher overheat temperature before you get to steel. So thanks again, Brian, for pointing that out. Looks like we've completed the suit, so we can actually now go through the very manual process of delivering every single suit. Eventually, they're gonna enable copy settings on this, but for now, we have to do it manually. And now that my carpal tunnel is flared up, it's time to put in our checkpoint. Now to get everybody inside the base, we're gonna make sure that this door is only one way until we get everybody back inside. So we're gonna say passing up through the door is not permitted, but passing down through it is. Because there's this weird point when you're trying to actually get everybody inside the base, that way they can start using the docks that you really do just need everybody inside, and then we can open up this wall, add the door, and everybody can be on their way. At that point, we'll lock this airlock, build some tiles around it, remove the door, and finish it up with some insulated tile. All right, I think we have everybody in, so let's remove all access to that door. We'll build some temporary tiles here, and that way when we remove this door to put some insulated tile, people don't start running back and forth through that area because now the only place we want them to go out is right here so we'll deconstruct these two insulated tiles and then put a door in and look at this it looks like thor is going to be our first suit wearer now we don't have to deal with any of those suffocating messages or anything else which is also going to help on the stress you can see we have three or four dupes with high stress right now because working down in these areas where there's no oxygen they start getting stressed out and they start complaining half the time they couldn't even come down to this area to pick up needed materials because they'd run out of breath and this is what i was talking about making sure these towels are here now we can deconstruct this and finish it up and now that we have our awesome suits it's time to get working on the power plant. I'm gonna give the dupes a few cycles to catch up on all the stuff they missed out while we had the base locked down. But once they do that, I think it's gonna be go time. We're gonna bore this entire area out and put a giant industrial sauna and power plant. It's just gonna be a power plant right now because we don't have the steam turbines to really turn it into an industrial sauna. Apparently Wonder Woman needed a day trip to the spa. Not a big deal. Get all that tension out, Wonder Woman. You'll be fine. During the process of bringing all that cool steam vent water over to this tank, some of the water's gotten up to be 38 to 40 degrees. That's why we've built this system. Now our tank is completely temperature controlled. It all starts with this thermo sensor. This thermo sensor is timed with a liquid tepidizer and says, hey, if this temperature is below 28 degrees, turn on and heat the water up. This thermo sensor is responsible for cooling the tank back down. If we set this to say, hey, we want it to stay below 29 degrees, it'll then shut this door. And by shutting this door, it allows temperature exchange from the environment out here and this water. So because we have this system in place, I think we're now gonna adjust our temperatures. Remember our most temperature sensitive plant in the colony is the thimble reed, which can survive at around 22 to 37. So let's just shoot for 25. So if the temperature is below 25, it'll send a green signal to this liquid tepidizer. If the temperature is below 28 degrees, open this door up because it's already cold enough in here. But otherwise, keep this door closed and keep sending chill into this water. 
Now, this isn't a ton of cooling potential, so we're actually going to duplicate this over. There we go. That's much better. And since we're redoing this, we put in all aluminum doors. Now, the aluminum ore, it's not the best on thermal conductivity, but it's much better than a lot of the other ores with a thermal conductivity of 20. And you can already see the igneous rock below the base is already heating up, which means a lot of the heat is leaving this tank and dumping into the environment below. And vice versa, the chill is being transferred in. Now in the future, if we need to, we can expand this system all the way throughout the bottom of the tank, and it'll increase the amount of area we have for that good thermal conductivity. And now let's dig out our power plant. I'm not 100% sure that we're going to be using it as an industrial sauna later, or maybe just the power plant. Who knows? But either way, we want it to be conveniently located to our beautiful transport network on this side. So to start with, I think we just dig everything out. This is a good start here. We're going to go ahead and go up to dupe number 12. And then I think we have to pause it there until we get off of omelets into barbecue. But Travaldo, Ren, and Meep all help out the colony in different ways. Travaldo would be an excellent second researcher. You know we could use one of those. Ren could be our permanent decorator doctor combining those two jobs that hardly ever needed, but you still need a dupe running around that can do them. He actually starts with a minus three to creativity, but it could be worse, right? And then we have Meep, an operator farmer who could probably make another mechatronics engineer, who, which by the way, is better at decorating than the decorator. So back to power shell we go, dupe number three. I think this is our second Meep, and quite frankly, we're running out of ideas on how to name the dupes. So I'm just picking Marvel and DC characters that I like. In this case, Meep's good at operating machinery. Well, guess what? So is the Punisher. Welcome to Paradise, Punisher. Small update on our water tank. Temperature control system is working beautifully. Right across the pipes, it's 27 degrees. Even up top where the hot water is coming in, it's only sitting at around 31. Well, all right. That looks a lot better. You'll notice we also started our main power spine. And yes, I'm going through the pain in the butt of moving this over by two tiles. The pump will be over here, and when we're done, the power spine will be able to continue through. I'm not happy about it either, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. But, I suppose we can start with our frame, and I think we're just gonna use standard insulated tiles. And I don't wanna make it too tight on our main colony. You never know what you might use this space for. I think we'll just go four rows high, and then we may need to leave some space for some liquid locks, so we'll back it off to about here, and then seal the whole thing in there. A little entrance. I don't think we need to liquid lock it yet, but we may decide in the future, hey, this is what we need to do. We'll see. Let's see how long it takes our slow dupes to finish this one. Well, that wasn't too bad. We added some joint plates here at the edge, and this is where all of our power will end up connecting to our spine. Now, right now we have two forms of power. We have coal generation and the potential for some natural gas generators. I think we're gonna start with this natural gas geyser. Doing the math on this geyser, at 288 grams per second with this eruption period and this active period, it comes out to be 109 grams per second indefinitely. Now you'll notice that our natural gas generators can actually use 90 grams per second. So this would say, okay, well, we only have enough natural gas for 1.2 natural gas generators. And until they invent us a way to make 0.2 of a generator, we're stuck with just using this size natural gas generator. But that's only on the prediction that it's actually working 100% of the time. So let's predict that it's only working a third of the time. In that case, we might be able to get away with three or four natural gas generators. We'll see. Regardless, we're going to have to store up some of the excess natural gas because we don't want it to all backlog inside of here. This is already at five kilos, which means we're actually wasting natural gas right now. So to start with, we'll put on some nice mesh tiles and then throw down some natural gas generators. Now, the great thing about the natural gas generator is it's actually going to produce us some more polluted water. We're going to take that and throw it right back into our polluted water tank, and then we're just going to skim and clean the carbon dioxide. Now, eventually, it may be hot enough inside this power room to actually run slicksters. That's the sort of reason why I don't want to turn this into necessarily its own industrial sauna, because in our industrial sauna, we'd have just steam. Or in an industrial cold brick, you'd have just hydrogen. 
Well, with all these different sources of power generation, we're going to be producing polluted water. We're going to be producing carbon dioxide. So it's better just to keep this as our power station. We're actually going to make some more room here and put a smart battery. Now, eventually, we're going to have to worry about cooling this area. Yes, even on Rhyme. But right now, I think we're okay as is. So we're just going to make everything out of materials that we have. And right now, we're just using copper ore. Based on how much copper ore I'm finding, though, I think we're eventually going to have to switch over to using iron ore, which sounds disgusting, because normally you want to save that iron ore for all your steel production. We're also going to go ahead and put in all of our coal generation up here as well. I figure two sets of coal generators will be just fine. Since the dupes are working on that, I figured it's about time that we actually tap into this natural gas geyser, and we're actually going to have to use steel for this one, because that natural gas is coming in at over 150 degrees. And then we're going to put a small atmos sensor in here just to be able to control the flow. In the case that we eventually want to limit how much it pulls out of, we'll be able to do that. In the middle of construction, I've changed a couple of things over. I decided to only have one heavy watt joint plate coming out the side. This will give us a lot more room to be able to put transformers down. For instance, we can just plop a transformer right here and then tie it in. And for a couple of reasons, we decided to build our power generators out of gold amalgam. First, because we have a lot more gold amalgam than we do copper. As odd as that sounds. But second, because it has an overheat temperature of plus 50 degrees. So this room can get all the way up to 125 degrees Celsius, and we don't have anything to worry about. And then finally, we're going to hook them all up to automation. And that way, each level of our power plant will have different conditions on when it turns on and when it doesn't. For instance, maybe we want the natural gas generators first. So they turn on whenever the power requirement gets below 60. And then the coal generators might kick on at 40 and 20, respectively. We'll see. And now we have a couple of other contingencies we got to deal with. First, the polluted water being emitted by the natural gas generator. And this, we're just going to use regular liquid pumps, and we're going to set them apart just far enough that they should be able to pick up all the polluted water. I have the building ranges mod on. This will give us the ability to see where this liquid pump will draw from. And each liquid pump butts up to each other. And that way, we're able to gather all the polluted water. Just in case, we've put some deodorizers in because we don't want all the polluted oxygen to be able to run free here. Eventually, we'll want to keep this a clean environment. And then we're just connecting each pump and draining it right by our tank. Now, one day we may have to deal with the fact that this hydro sensor here actually controls this liquid's vent's flow. So when water comes all the way up here, this vent shuts. And we're not necessarily going to want that pipe to shut. If we have to deal with that, we will. But for right now, it's just fine. The other thing that we'd have to take care of is all the carbon dioxide coming out of the natural gas generators. And you may think, well, just put it right here. Eventually, this whole power plant's going to be filled with different generators that are going to be producing different amounts of carbon dioxide. And that's the reason why we put it next to the door. As soon as any carbon dioxide makes it all the way over here, it gets destroyed. We even have a vent here. Now, right now it's overpressurized, but it is going down. This will all eventually get to equilibrium. And when it does, we'll keep the air pressure in here enough to where it'll always have a little bit of room in order to vent the carbon dioxide. As it is, we've got a small backlog of carbon dioxide. Just a little bit. To make matters worse, all the coal generators also produce carbon dioxide. So for this reason, we're going to have a little stopgap system where we're just, where we're venting the oxygen out of here. I had tried to put some airflow tiles in order to equalize with the environment above. And we're also digging up here to it creates more vacuum space that the oxygen needs to fill into. But until we get access to these beautiful high pressure gas vents, this is kind of what we're stuck doing. And that's the old vent everything you don't want into the vacuum of space trick. Now we have a gas vent here at the very top of our planetoid and gas pipes that come all the way down and are connected to this simple little system here. And it just says, hey, if the ambient pressure around here is above 1900 grams, time to siphon some of it out. And it wasn't exactly functioning because I didn't connect it back through the door yet, but we're getting there. And then we also put a thermal sensor connected to a space heater here. This won't be here very long. And it's just waiting for this whole room to sort of heat up. And that way, the water didn't freeze inside the water sieve pipes. Now, is this a perfect system? Absolutely not. But it does take care of a lot of the carbon dioxide that's coming out of here. So I'm not too worried about it. We went, also went around in the background and removed all the other coal generators that were doing random jobs. Oh, as a matter of fact, I forgot about this one. Let's get rid of this one, too. That's better. And that's the beauty of this system. Anytime we need power anywhere on the spine... 
we just throw down a power transformer, connect some conductive wire to it, and we're done. And you can see we've already done a decent job of building the spine up and down our colony. Our main base has three power transformers running it. One serves this cool steam vent, the carbon skimmer down here, the liquid pump, and the liquid tepidizer. Another one services everything else in the bottom of the base. And then the last one services everything else on top. It's always a good feeling when you get your power spine in. And look at this. There's virtually no carbon dioxide in here. And all that the natural gas generator is producing is coming out through this vent to where we don't even have a backlog anymore. We have an absolute ton of natural gas saved up. We put five reservoirs here. We may use more if we learn that, hey, five is not enough and we're still overpressurizing inside the little natural gas room. Oh my goodness, what are you? Oh, sigh. One piece of sandstone. Well, you know what has to happen. We're going to get that sandstone. You know we can't just leave sandstone anywhere nilly-willy. And as soon as it's done, we'll go put this back. And of course, a little oxygen's gonna get in there, but no big deal. No big deal. We'll just break some machines. It's okay. The last thing we did was move the excess hydrogen generator from our oxygen supply over here. Remember, if you will, we used to have the hydrogen generator here to siphon off all the extra hydrogen that we were creating. Instead, we're sending it all the way over to our power plant and to this hydrogen generator. This battery is set very aggressively at 9890. And as soon as it's connected to the main power spine, the entire power plant will first use the hydrogen generator anytime the power gets below 90 and go all the way up to 98. Remember, our hydrogen generator doesn't even kick on till 70 and then only goes to 90. This is for a couple reasons. A, it'll make sure that we're burning off all that excess hydrogen. And B, well, hydrogen's the cleanest power there is. It produces 800 watts, and that's it. There's no extra waste we need to take care of. And there it is. Now that the hydrogen generator's connected to the power line, only the hydrogen generator's running. Eventually, we'll have more power draw, and then the natural gas generators will kick on, and then the coal generators in that order. Because we're using even less natural gas, we needed to add a few more reservoirs. Today, we got the Atmo suits up and running, and we also have our power plant going. Now it's all about expansion. Anywhere we need to go, we're going to be able to do it because we're going to have the power to put there and we're going to be in Atmo suits. And that's good because the next stop we're heading is the oil biome. We need some of this oil so we can start making plastic. And look at all this beautiful lead and diamond. Oh, we're going to have a ball coring that out. I hope you had fun watching this episode and I'll talk to you soon.